When The Last of Us Part Two was released a couple years ago, it was divisive, to say the least. Critics absolutely loved it. Very highly rated, game of the year, all that good stuff. Now fans, that was a bit of a different story. Leading up to the release of the game, there were some spoilers, some leaks giving away some pretty important story points, and fans were not happy about this, and they railed on the game hard. Now I usually try to stay away from spoilers when it comes to games I want to play, but this was impossible to avoid. So there were three things I knew about the game. I knew about Joel, I knew about Abby, and I also knew that apparently the game was a pretty miserable experience overall. And given everything that was going on in the world at the time, I didn't want to play it. I wasn't in the right mind state to play something miserable. Fast forward a couple of years and Naughty Dog reveals that they're going to remake the original for the PS5. And this got me curious. It had been several years, but I do remember the remaster already looking and playing pretty damn good. But this was a perfect opportunity for me to revisit The Last of Us Part 1 and finally get around to playing Part 2. And after having played both of them twice, I was even more curious as to what all the hate was about when it came to this game. So I went back and listened to several of the more negative reviews and critique videos regarding this game in an attempt to understand why it was that they did not like it. I noticed several underlying points that were consistent throughout most of them, particularly regarding Joel's death and the circumstances around it. Abby, just Abby in general, a lot of people just didn't like her for whatever reason. And what would be called sloppy storytelling and bad pacing. And I found all of this very interesting. I did play both of these games back to back, which definitely had an influence on my perspective on the overall story. And of course, knowing Joel and Abby and all these things that happen also affects how I looked at it because I already knew these things were going to happen and I was more interested on how they were put together as opposed to being shocked that they happened in the first place. Playing it like this was a very unique experience. Both of these games play so similarly that it did feel like a singular experience as opposed to playing two games separated by years of development. And it also changed my overall perspective on Joel as a character. Many people were very, very upset at the fact that Joel died. Some people were not necessarily upset at the fact that Joel died, but rather the way he was killed. Saying things like, he would have never slipped up, and it's sloppy writing how they did it. But when you look at it from beginning to end, yes, Joel deserved to die. He was, for the most part, an irredeemable monster. A violent individual, self-motivated. And even his saving of Ellie at the end of part one was, at least from my perspective, a selfish thing. He did it not because he necessarily cared about Ellie as an individual. Throughout most of their journey in part one, he didn't particularly even like her and rejected her outright. Rather, I look at it as a surrogate daughter, a replacement for the little girl he lost at the beginning of the game. And he was willing to lie to her as to what he did and why he did it, just to keep her close. And you see the effect this has on Ellie, right from the ending of the first game. And you could just see that something doesn't sit right with her about all of this, causing her to 
seek out the truth for herself, creating a huge identity crisis and ultimately forming a rift between herself and Joel that was not repaired by the time Joel is murdered by Abby. Now there are some people that have argued that the way Joel ended up revealing himself to Abby is bad writing, doesn't make sense. They'll show scenes from the game in which Joel is overly cautious about all of these things and would never slip up like that. And yes, Joel is overly cautious. But if you look at it, he is overly cautious with regards to Ellie. Not necessarily himself. And this is just factually incorrect because it isn't Joel that reveals himself in the first place. It is Tommy. Some people may say that no, Tommy wouldn't do this either. But in reality, yeah, he would. His personality was a family-oriented, community-driven individual. He would naturally greet and introduce himself and invite strangers over to join his community in Jackson because that was his primary motivation along the way. And in some regards, I felt bad for Tommy because all he wanted to do was settle down and relax and Joel just comes back into his life with his drama and his nonsense and drags him into scenario after scenario which ultimately breaks him as a person both physically and psychologically even ruining his own marriage because of his need to avenge his brother's death which I wonder if he should have bothered doing in the first place Tommy knew that Joel had done a bunch of people dirty this was not surprising. My wife made a curious observation that I found very interesting. If Joel was so concerned that people might be coming after him, wouldn't he have changed his name, maybe assumed a new identity? And to this, all I could think is, shouldn't he have done this already? This man was a terrible human being. He'd acknowledged he was one of those marauders stopping people at the roadside to strip them of their belongings. He had a long list of people willing to kill him at this point. If this mattered to him, he would have long been Bob or Jim or Fred or Ethan. But he never bothered because this never much mattered to him. What's he going to do about it now? Lie? It's too late for that. Abby already knows who he is. The die has been cast. This man is a goner. He is about to be brutally beaten, tortured, and killed. Then Ellie shows up just in time to witness this, and she just snaps. We're talking about a young lady that already has no sense of purpose. Someone who feels as if they shouldn't even be alive. Couple that with the skills that she's picked up through having been around Joel during his murderous rampage of dozens upon dozens of people. And this is a recipe for disaster. They have just unleashed a monster onto this world. And her quest for revenge and bloodlust causes her to fall apart as a human being, leaving her absolutely broken and alone by the end of all of this, creating a fascinating contrast within the story between Ellie's character arc and Abby's. These are two intersecting paths unified by the singular catalyst of Joel's decision to spare Ellie. The first half of the game, you follow Ellie and her girlfriend on a three-day mission across Seattle in an attempt to track down those people responsible for Joel's death. While you certainly can sympathize with Ellie's motivations, you very quickly start to notice the toll her need for revenge is taking on her and the strain it is putting on her relationships with those people that she loves. 
And this is something that has to be brought up because Ellie's relationship with her girlfriend is a vital aspect of this storyline. And this is apparently some issue that some people have. This SWJ agenda. I'm not going to talk much about this because I don't see it as a valid reason to dislike a video game. Let's just say, if this is how you feel, you and I do not agree and would likely not get along or be friends. That's about as diplomatic as I could put it. And let's just move on because it has to be mentioned. It was an issue people had for some reason. Having said that, and I can't even believe it needs to be said nowadays, what's wrong with you people? I'm going to try my hardest not to give away too many specific story details. Little things like the significance of Ellie's relationship with Dina, her girlfriend. But after the third day, for Dina-related reasons, Ellie decides it's time to call it quits. There's more important things than this. I have slaughtered enough people. It's time to go home. Then Ellie and Abby cross paths. And the clock is reset back to day one. And you replay the events leading up to this confrontation from Abby's perspective shortly after she finished killing Joel and is just trying to move on with her life. Abby is a fascinating character and one that I did not expect to like as much as I did. In all my years of gaming, and I have been playing video games for a long time now, I have never encountered a character more disliked than Abby for reasons that range from the more absurd, like she's way too buff, she would have needed juice. There's no way she could have had this kind of nutrition in this post-apocalyptic wasteland. This is just not accurate. Looking back at some of the flashback sequences when she was a teenager, you could just see that she had the genetic profile for this. Broad shoulders, thick, strong arms and legs. And this was before she started training hard for four years straight to seek revenge on the man that ruined her life. She also lived in a community with a weight training facility and functional agriculture. Not only did she have the genetics, but also the resources and motivation to build up this kind of musculature. This was not something I ever questioned even once while playing this game. As for the more understandable reason why she kills our beloved Joel, I think I've already established that Joel was not a particularly good person, and someone wanting to kill him for having been wronged by something he did was not surprising in the least. While I can understand that some people may grow attached to him and would just hate Abby regardless just because she is the person that killed him. I'm not that kind of person. I do not grow attached on any level to a fictional character. While I can appreciate a well-written and well-fleshed out character in a movie or book or video game or TV show, it's not like Joel was all that particularly well fleshed out to begin with. He was just a guy that lost his daughter at the beginning of a pandemic and has spent the last 20 years of his life just surviving. But through his encounter with Ellie is reminded of that love he had for his daughter. Then makes one very questionable choice at the end of the game. So when you view The Last of Us within the context of the overarching narrative, part two is about the consequences of one man's poor decision and the negative impact it has had on those affected by it, with the implication that this may include society at large. Joel may have possibly doomed 
everyone to a global scourge. As a standalone game, however, while groundbreaking in its day for its storytelling and presentation, for a video game, the story of The Last of Us isn't much more than a good episode of The Walking Dead. No matter how you slice it, regardless of your feelings towards Joel, Despite his noble intentions, despite his love for Ellie, it is hard to deny that he is the real bad guy in this world. Joel's decisions may have possibly ruined everything for everyone. Which is surprising that so many people still disliked Abby at the end of this story. I was expecting her to be framed as the villain of the story. This is just not the case. When you're first introduced to her at the beginning of the game, she is just a person motivated to get back at Joel for the wrong he caused her. When you're reintroduced to her 10 hours in, and you actually find out why she did it in the first place, her motivations for revenge are no less justifiable than Ellie's. More so, even. Now, revenge is a terrible motivator. It's only going to lead people to do horrific things. And I did not find either one of these characters to be particularly likable. However, Abby's story was at least interesting. She is portrayed as a far more dynamic and nuanced character than Ellie is. Right off the bat, they spare Ellie and Tommy. There's people that argued that they should not have done this. Boom, boom, both of them dead. They cover their tracks and no one would be seeking revenge. Story over. I don't agree at all. I would argue that killing the leader of a community would drive even more people within the community to seek out revenge, not just a handful of people close to one man. And the reason why they spared them to is a fairly straightforward and understandable reason. We killed them. We're no better than he was. Abby could have just killed them both, regardless of what this guy says. But she doesn't. They just weren't her targets. This shows her to be a far more disciplined and controlled individual than Ellie is. The way these two stories layer one on top of the other does a great job in highlighting the differences between these two personalities and how they handle their respective traumas, taking them both in completely different directions. But the wild ride and journey of self-realization and personal growth that Abby goes through is something that I was not expecting. She disregards direct orders from the leader of her militia group in order to look for a companion that has gone missing proceeds to get kidnapped by a group of religious zealots that she has been warring with for years, then gets saved by two young members of this very same cult while they're being persecuted by their own people for reasons that a lot of us out there would find personally relatable. Has a very unfortunate, yet admittedly rather human interaction with her ex-boyfriend, ruining her relationship with a childhood friend. But this same interaction compels her to want to help out the people that saved her, leading her right into the heart of enemy territory. As a result of this, she is in turn persecuted by her own people over their refusal to listen to her reasons why she's there. Then she returns from this ordeal, having formed a bond with someone she once perceived to be the enemy, only to witness the aftermath of Ellie's carnage, leading us right back to the moment of their confrontation, which ends in a stalemate, mostly because of this bond. I grew quite fond of Abby throughout her journey, and her story is far better than Ellie's comparatively simple revenge tale. Now the game could have just ended right here, and everything would be fine. They part ways, Abby moves on to whatever adventures may face her, 
Ellie and Dina settle down into a life of relative peace, and all would be good. But, no, it's not over just yet. A lot of people complained that the game should have just ended right there, and it drags on for way too long past this point. But I don't feel this is the fault of the story, or the pacing. This game drags on because of the gameplay loop. Both games are guilty of this. You spend way too much time opening drawers, gathering resources for your various upgrades, and this adds needless busy work when you just want to enjoy the story. Which would have felt incomplete to me had it just ended right here. This is the point where you reunite with Ellie, and she indeed does have that happy little life, and everything seems to be just fine, but she is so devastated and overcome with such crippling PTSD that she just can't let it go. At the first opportunity she gets, she decides to pursue Abby once more. Up to this point, I really felt bad for her for everything she'd gone through, but now I was really starting to dislike her. She could have tried to heal and move on, but she needed to continue her pursuit of vengeance. So by the time she finally tracks down Abby and the circumstances surrounding their confrontation, I grew to hate her. I hated the fact that Ellie was willing to forsake everything over this. I hated what she was about to do, just hoping that what I thought was about to happen was not the case. And I absolutely hated the developers for making me control her as she did all of this. I had an intense and visceral response to what was happening, talking at my TV in the middle of the night cursing out the developers and begging them to make it all stop. And this is just not like me. I've never seen a movie or TV show, much less played a video game, that has made me react like this. But somehow Naughty Dog forced me to empathize with these characters by taking away any sense of agency I may have had throughout the entire experience. I was forced to feel everything in this miserable, miserable experience. And by the time it was over, I was exhausted. This is a testament to how great the storytelling in this game is. I went right back and played through it a second time. And knowing everything, the impact was not lessened in any way whatsoever. Thinking back, I can understand if you grew fond of Joel in the first game, how you would hate the fact that they kill him off, or hate Abby for having done so. But to say that this is sloppy storytelling, or poorly paced, is just not so. And all those people that dislike the game, maybe should come back and give it a shot now that it's been a couple of years. And for anyone out there that has not yet played it, you need to pick up this masterpiece. Just be ready for a sad and intense experience, but one that is very much worth having.